And I don't know if you guys know about this, but there is now a free live transcript feature in Zoom. So I'm going to yeah. turn that sucker on too. Which gives us a rudimentary transcript. It's pretty good. I think I think they're moving, they're connecting it to otter.ai. Uh, but I'm I was surprised to find this as a free offer. It used to be available only in the business account. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Cool. Well, um, where to start? Where should we start? There's like yeah. a feast, there's a feast on the table in front of us. Do you have do you have a leaning, uh, Marie? Well, uh, let me share with you a little bit of where my thinking has evolved to. And then I would really like to hear about what work you're doing and how we might apply things pragmatically. So the thing that is of very high importance to me is that I believe that patterns have a top-down structure with a bottom-up execution. Okay. I don't, so I'm not, I haven't really talked to anybody about this. So excuse me while I make up words and metaphors. Um, there has to be some amount of structure. Uh, the problem with structures are that they tend to look more like hierarchies than networks and they imply a, um, a worth pyramid. Right, the higher you are in the pyramid, the more worth you have, and the more responsibility you have, and the more money you should get, and uh, it it, it um, automatically creates extrinsic motivators, and then those extrinsic motivators take over everybody's behavior. Yeah. When you go full self-organizing, like a five-person startup. You have the opposite of that. You had uh, and practices emerge like don't be evil. And we meet at eight in the coffee room, and you know what, what, whatever those things, whatever the things are. And so, the trick is to move power and authority from the hierarchy into the nodes and the nodes have a very interesting they, they can be physical they can be human beings but nodes to me show up in all kinds of processes and what we tend to do as humans is we go hierarchical and we set a goal once we've set a goal we may argue about the best way to get there and then we cut off all other possibilities period it's done Whereas I like to think about emergence as if you have certain practices, like uh, with kids in school in particular, that you support their motivation, and there are specific practices for that, that you support their metacognition, and there are specific practices for that. And they, they learn to do those practices, you do those practices with them, the workplace does those practices, as a side effect, all the things that you tried to achieve through goals happen in an environment that is created for serendipity. I think it is possible to identify a lot of the practices that support serendipity and oddly enough, most of them come out of religious or philosophical traditions, even though they're never used that way. So one that I particularly like is grace, right? If you learn to have grace for the people you're talking with, then you, you remove so much friction and misunderstanding. Trickiest part is to have grace for yourself but if you have grace for yourself, then you remove the need to climb ladders and win arguments and, and, and so on, right? Yeah. So for me, um, giving grace is a fundamental practice. And I can't, and there, of all the things that you can put on top of it, that one's just like always, is always necessary. 
And if I, if I, I think, I believe that the country is going to fall apart in the next five or 10 years. And I'm sowing seeds. I'm learning Portuguese. I've got a European passport. I'm looking at what, what places are going to be most livable within the United States as climate changes. What are, uh, I'm talking to friends who have skills in various things. Now, none of those are a plan. None of those have a goal, but I'm sowing all these seeds that will hopefully that, that will hopefully be there to harvest at a time when it's right. So that notion of emergent serendipity, along with a organizing structure, is to me the key. And then those organizing structures may very well have goals, but they need to be very well defined and described. And if they do not serve humanity, these approaches aren't going to work. So that's my thing. Wonderful. So, so many different exciting, rich pieces there. Um, one of the things that 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 really strikes me, and 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 your description of sort of the the steps that you're taking, um, is that piece of of yeah, it's it's fostering emergence, it's building capacity. It makes me think of a slime mold, where you know it's 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 getting the stuff ready to go, but it doesn't necessarily know where it needs to go yet. But then the pieces are there, so that when you say you need to, um, you're able to say like great. Here's, here's the network and the community and the skills and the resources that I have been just engaging with, and here's the shape they need to take right now. And it feels like one of the things, I really am becoming increasingly sort of an unmanagement evangelist in feeling that the more we build regular practice of just experiencing collaboration with each other in this approach, um, right. the more we build up our capacity for resilience, the more we build up this kind of a network, and the more we move that critical piece that you were mentioning of um, rather than focusing on here is the work and at all costs do the work, focusing on this is the way to be in a way that naturally the work just gets done uh, because it's so much more flexible and can evolve to whatever the circumstance happens to be, whether or not the predefined work okay. might work to be doing or not. Exactly. And the purpose of structure is to remove friction and ensure communication and those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, no, I, I love what, what you're what you're mentioning there, Jerry, about the kind of that, that slime mold piece as well, that absolutely there'll be that environmental trigger and all of a sudden it's in, you know, now they're gathering together and forming their their fruiting body and such. Um, the, or sporing body, the, um, so one of the things that we're doing at Thomaso in terms of this also is we're trying to take uh, an approach that is um, taking the human centeredness of it as the the seed piece, the core of it all, kind of the keystone, and then the rest of it is just kind of it's the practices within that. So rather than saying um, again, you know, our goal is to be working on on fostering projects that relate to the SDGs, um, but that rather than pushing hard on that as a mandate, what we're doing is having lots of conversations with people like you. Um, on Saturdays, we have a community gathering where we almost never get into talking about like nitty gritty about projects or what people are working on. It's just a chance for people to talk, to get to know each other, to express whatever's alive for them and to get a feel for who each other are. Um, and the more we've been doing that, the more potential projects just naturally unfold. So we'll have an hour's worth of conversation about whatever we happen to want to talk about that day. And at the end, it'll be like, oh, and here's two like well-defined crystals for projects that, and here's the people we should talk to about whether or not those are projects that are viable and should maybe happen or not. Um, really serendipitous. And, and that's what it's all about. It's, it's all serendipity and grace and just sort of seeing where the connections are, seeing where sparks happen and then fostering them. Um, and, and really just aiming for that flexibility piece with it. And similarly, then the, the work that we end up doing with different organizations um, ends up being just wildly different for different organizations, because it isn't that we're saying, here's the widget that we're offering, or here's the specific course that we offer. Um, 
it's just talking and figuring out and if there's a place where it seems like there's something that our community has something that it can offer then we say like oh hey why don't i put you in touch with so and so and let's just see if something happens or we'll say it sounds like you could maybe use you know uh, we have a notion template for organizations that are at the early stages of getting going if you like we can set that up for you and, and do a couple of sessions of have you through it would that be of interest um, and just, yeah, just kind of take play, playing together to, to figure out what those kind of pieces are. Um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. And I love, I really am excited about the idea of trying to, one of my goals is again, to have some folks like both of you who can function as, I mean, an informal, I mean, it's more of a play group, but that, you know, in formal words, it's an advisory council who's able to, um, to do that bridging between the sort of nascent theory that we're that we're building around what unmanagement is, and then finding the right opportunities to test that out and to put that into into practice in different places and sort of That's put great. it in places and and learn from that and just document what goes well and what doesn't go well. Um, and the last piece I'll ramble because it sort of is alive for me in the moment that that we're doing because I think that. Uh, not that everyone, not that every unmanaged organization has to take this approach, but um, that piece of extrinsic motivation that you mentioned, um, one of the one of the breaks to put on that is just making it so that everything that we're doing is MIT open source, so that anybody can take it, do whatever they want with it. If they profit from that, that's great. If they release whatever they're doing, that's great. But simply to to make an ever growing uh, resource that's there, and so many of the different struggles that come from the extrinsic motivations of how are we best going to make a profit out of this then just dissolve and you can just focus on doing the stuff they do for the organization but the individuals will still be measuring the size of their offices for us that's easy because everyone's office is in the house <laughs> no, no. Yeah, but you know what i mean but i totally know what you mean yeah yeah it makes me think of when uh, i remember hearing the uh the Dalai Lama, when my, my, my friend and I were in India back in, in 99, and him talking about, you know, even the, the most learned Rinpoche's, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that was great. Um, but the, like even most learned Rinpoche's um, still argue about who gets the, the highest chair. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 yeah, we April and I stayed at an Airbnb in in Oakland many years ago, which was also a Zen uh, monastery, and um, run by a really cool woman who I still follow on on Twitter and stuff. But but her obsession with coffee and the off limits part of the kitchen, which delayed, related to coffee, was the least Zen thing I had seen in a really long time. <clears throat> she she was like com completely on it with a timer and a thermometer and the whole the whole like really into the whole really into my coffee and don't touch my coffee kind of thing. It was a meditation. That's why it has. To yeah, be. exactly. It was her practice. Um, so, so, so just kind of throwing this on the table. Um, one of my amateur beliefs about change is that um, we need to be able to tell a lot of stories um, that other people can hear. And then every now and then they'll be like, oh, 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 I'd like to try that. Or that sounds interesting. Either tell me more or how do I do that? At which point we could call in from the loose network of people who knows stuff and knows people and, and either connect to the person who did it or uh, marshal up some resources. Those, the resources at hand ideally would be in pattern languages and then in open source bodies of code because some of it can be instrumented or can be stood up or if somebody right. has already done it before, why replicate their effort? Why not build on their effort and then yeah. contribute back to their pile of open source whatever it was that you modified or improved, right? And if we keep doing that, we build these sort of platforms. And then, um, then basically lather, rinse, repeat. So, so tell stories, figure out where attention is going, follow that in, in interest, not by telling people what to do, but by helping them get done the thing they think they wanna do. Uh, and then all while curating or improving the commons. I love that. A, a, a couple of seeds that I'll, I'll throw out just from the network side. <clears throat> we have a couple of people who we've been talking a bunch with who have been sparking a lot of joy. Uh, one is Brenda Kiesel, who's, whose project is The Village, and they're working on, um, uh, it, it's, it's storytelling. It's connecting through personal story. And so they'll have a loose theme. And then it's just building, fostering compassion, empathy, and connection between people. 
by, by listening to each other's stories. And so she's got a real gift for she that she ended up working with um, with Archer's Initiative Ukraine now, um, just so that the people who were actively engaged in there it started out as kind of I think a support circle really for people to just talk about what was coming up for them in that work because it's intense, um, and has turned into a whole other other kind of piece with that. Um, yeah, no, any, any story aggregation is, is a really interesting thing. We also, there's there's a really uh, a neat group where we're in conversation with called Storybox who are working on um, developing the tools to allow right relation in story sharing when it's um, important story. So they're especially focused on indigenous culture um, where, um, it's important to capture story, but it's also important to know, you know, I've been given permission to tell this story to you personally. Um, and, and so that that can percolate out and so that both the rights and the permissions and the collection of those stories is something that can be managed through, you know, smart contracts and, and distributed ledger and all that kind of thing. Um, but well, yeah, and absolutely that that piece of, of, of how important location is and, and and place and story yeah um the other thing that's that again just kind of pops to mind and then i'll i'll step back is um is that it's interesting because i'm used to with pattern language it typically being bringing together some people who are sort of steeped subject matter experts in a given area to talk about and discern and that what's so interesting with unmanagement is that it's the recognition right off the bat that pattern language is an important um, modality for trying to capture what this is about. Um, but that there aren't, I mean, there are experts in the different aspects of it, but it feels like it's something where we're just on the cusp of something that we're figuring out, like, what is it and what does it look like? And that that's a really interesting different story. Go ahead, Mimi. I think the, the problem we have here is the Toyota problem. Okay. So the Americans wanted to understand why Toyota was doing so well. And they went over there and saw their quality approach. They saw everything and they came back with no knowledge. Because it was alien to them? Because it because, was- Because they couldn't understand it. They couldn't see it. They The only framework that was available to them mm -hmm. was a hierarchical one. So and the notion that independent agents all doing what they believe is best will somehow create something other than chaos is not something they, they had the capacity to think about. Right. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that most of the work that I've done here, so I, the, on, on the industry side, I had about 10 years to practice. On the education side, I had about 10 years to hit my head against a wall. And on the parenting side, well, that experiment is still ongoing after two decades. <laughs> and most of the things that I think matter here, all the lower layer stuff, before you get into processes and stuff, all the lower layer stuff are more about thriving. How do you thrive as an individual? And part of the answer, you thrive as an individual in community with other people in relationships with other people oh and psychopaths can't do relationships that's why they can't thrive mm -hmm. right um so i'm i'm thinking about an l an l as elemental practices like motivation and metacognition so motivate, actually motivation is at a higher level because out of motivation, you've got those three things underneath that the um, autonomy, mastery and purpose, right? So autonomy, mastery and purpose are like atoms to me. We kind of know what those are. They're not things that really need to be explained. However, learning how to interact with others in supporting their autonomy and your own is, a, is, is Toyota. There's not a mindset for that. And until you have the mindset, everything looks like just another chart. And so I've been working on writing a couple of articles about, um, well, actually about kids, about educating kids and raising kids and 
using examples and they, and they, they have titles uh, like uh, stop telling kids they can change the world, mm. right? Because that's cruel. Most kids are not going to change the world and setting that expectation is completely inappropriate. Letting them know that the, that there are obstacles and for whatever they want, no matter what they want, there are obstacles. And in most cases, those obstacles can be overcome with hard work. That's a that's what you want to say, but it's not what people say. It's not what people teach kids. And so that's what kids come away with. And kids, kids are taught from birth that their wishes don't matter that they don't have bodily autonomy, that the universe just strikes out at them and tells them they're bad kind of randomly, right? That happens, to, and then it happens, they're prepared for it when it happens to school. And then it happens again when you go to work because by now you know how the hierarchy works and you're either a rebel, rebel or a or obsequious, like those are your only options. It's very hard to walk through that environment with dignity. And so that dignity is another piece that I have really been focusing on. Okay, now I'm rambling, rambling, rambling. What That's I great. want to get back to is that I think there are some things that are atomic enough so, that, so, we, so we can put atoms underneath agents, uh, um, motivation, we can put atoms under metacognition and call it learning that's a that's a pattern for learning whereas there should also be one for um you know approaching happiness right so and, and things under there include just like be kind help if you can because and not because not because not because you're extrinsically motivated to right? And not because it makes you a better person, but because you don't like to be in pain either. I read a book uh, about 20 years ago that had a story about a about Buddhist monks who were tortured in Tibet. And after they were rescued, one of them said, I was in very grave danger. And they said, yeah, we know. And he said, no, no, no. I was in very grave danger of feeling hate. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that pain is pain. Our bodies, our minds are created to be resilient to pain. We are not resilient to suffering. And in order to not suffer, you can't let, you, you, you have to clean up all the original sin of how our bodies evolved and get rid of jealousy and hatred and all those things that cause you pain. Yeah, it makes me me think a lot about um, one of the the core practices for me is uh, the the first set of uh, Patanjali sutras, and that the 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 version of it that that I'm familiar with has a whole little explanation when it's talking about you know some kinds of thoughts are painful and others not painful. Talking, oh, really? about, I'm not aware of them. That's wonderful. Talking about pain in exactly that. Uh, meaning so that when it's saying pain it doesn't mean as in it it makes you say ouch but it leads you further astray into the stuff that are right. the different yes that and the things that might be physically painful but that lead you to the place of i mean in 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 that terminology non-attachment mm -hmm. um uh, isn't painful um yeah right yeah um, so, so I think that there should be a core that's just about thriving. And then once you've got thriving, then you say, okay, so that's, that's true for an individual, right? And now what's the next unit up? It's the team or the family or the classroom. And how do, how, what are the patterns that are now created because of the additional complexity of more people? So yeah. that's kind of how I'm thinking about the structure. I love that. One of the things in terms of the kind of tears of, oh, sorry, Jerry, you had a, you had a thing. I'd like to hear it. Are you going to lose what you're about to say? I will. Thanks. Okay. 
Um, so two things I wanted to put in the conversation. One is something I put in the chat a little bit earlier, which is it feels like the core of the pattern language you're thinking about for on management is the core of the pattern language for parenting. Yes. Is the core of the pattern language for being a human in community. There's, yes. there's like this core. And I think we should call it out as such and maybe name that subset as such. Like there's just a high functioning core here uh, that, is, that is modular, shareable, should be pointed to by other pattern languages et cetera, et cetera. We offer it up as like almost parsable from the larger context of unmanagement, which is like business and management and whatever, because we don't want to turn people off from this core, which is about how to be a good human. I think that, uh, that the core should be a beautiful set of subroutines that then other things can call. Diamond Sutra of sorts. Yeah. Um, and then the second thought I had was, oh my gosh, this whole going to be, how do I, how am I Zen in the world? How do I drop all these needs and wants? It sounds unattainable. So I wrote, you know, there's this core that's shareable. And then there's this notion that, oh my God, if I need to be a perfect Zen being in order to do any of this, I'm done. I'm dead. I'm never going to try it. So as how do, though, as though there were a goal. Well, exactly. But, but, but there's the, there's a, there's a piece of how do we, um, invite people in uh, to do this in a way that's completely friendly, familiar, comfortable, and easy for them. Like do one, one simple step can change your life is a nice book. So, one, so one, one, one small step, sorry. So can one simple life. thing that you can always choose is assume positive intent. Bingo. And I go there all the time. And that is I a core, that is that is a core precept of design better. from trust. And nobody necessarily has thought through what that even means. And I think it means all the things we're talking about. Yes. So, so totally agree. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. And, the, and, and part of it too is to go aside that would be lovely to have the explanation of how brains work, how they're trained, and why we're all so fucked up. And that we all have coping mechanisms and stop judging coping, coping mechanisms if you don't have anything better to offer. Yeah, and I and I I really like that 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 piece that is like an an underpinning assumption that needs to be a part of the invitation uh, that that it's that everyone's on a path and a trajectory around all of this stuff, and that that we're all fumbling towards whatever it is and learn from each other's fumbles when we kind of transparently and humbly share them, rather than getting into again it's 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 avoiding wherever those are unnecessary hierarchies of here as the guru of this thing, let me show you how to do it. Exactly. And it's saying, here's my experiences, what are yours and what can we each learn from those and, and exactly. where are there problems within that, yeah. Yes. One of the things that, that strikes me is, um, is also this piece of sort of the, the, it's like the tiers of complexity that when you start just from thriving and that then as you're building community outwards, that it then becomes about, well, okay, then how, how do we help that community thrive? And as that community is expanding, you keep doing that. And so you start from, from a, a fairly simple set of, of processes and such around that. And that then it's as you get forward that you're identifying, well, here's the specific issues, you know, um, from the Corona Y perspective, for example, well, you know, COVID is having a sufficient impact on a lot of people's ability to thrive. So how do we as a community want to respond to that specific piece? And that you can then get into, you know, whatever, arbitrary levels of complexity needs to happen in order to say, well, how do we most effectively engage with that in a way that's meaningful? Um, but the other piece that, that fits with that, that, that um, I, I like how Archer has been describing more recently, um, kind of from, from the experience there, the sort of the, the push and pull and horizontal and vertical teams piece, where it really is have a big, you know, if it's something that has a mission, have the mission, have the mission well-defined, um, but have in it be English, something. please. Sorry. In English. Yes, please. exactly. Yes, have it be something that anybody can look at and say, like, yes, that. That's the thing that I, that's why I'm here. Um, and then to have the flexibility then within that for everybody to be brainstorming and talking about and sharing experience to say, well, we could do this and we could do that in a very yes and approach. Um, and that you then have, you know, inevitably you have a core team of people who are like, I, I'm going to put time and passion and energy into this more, but that you don't have to draw a line around that group. That's just something that happens. Um, but to then have it so that as a group um, helps the whole community engage around, well, which of these things are maybe priorities where we want to focus a little bit, 
have it so that you you build structure out of that, but not in a way that pairs away everything else. So okay. you keep the seething, roiling ideation space that everybody is in, where they're coming up with different ideas and forming their own sub teams, and it being much less about how well does this fit with our current blueprint than how much like is there where's their neat stuff going on where's their interesting energy and how do we support that interesting energy doing more of whatever it is that it's doing mm -hmm. um so figuring out how to fit the pieces together but not how to shoehorn them together in such a way that they lose that spark that, that makes them what they are mm -hmm. exactly um, a, a, yes, couple, a couple thoughts here um one of the things I find happens a lot in Open Global Mind is lots of people show up with on their own mission, and they're just trying to recruit people to their mission. And there isn't a lot of blending of missions or finding of overlaps, mm. which is a piece of what I'm really interested in doing more of. So what you get is like, I'm, I want to do Viking cosplay. No, no, no. We have to do emergency response for Ukraine. No, no, no. This is just an improv play. Let's have a great time. And it's like, it's really hard to sort of it's very hard to spend time with all the communities because you run out of time. That doesn't work. It's exhausting. Um, and many of the participants are so mission driven that they're not really flexible to bend towards some other mission or even to sort of adopt some of the practices or whatever else. So you have to make choices. And, and it's one thing to be really inclusive and to be, treat everyone with dignity and grace. It's another to figure out how do we make our path through this so that everybody can pick up from the interactions, the thing they need to help their project move forward, including volunteers who are now interested, et cetera, et cetera, without destroying the center in some way, because the center is fragile in, in some sense. And then too much exposure to too many new ideas every single time with no progress on any of them is just destructive to the group, I think, over time in some sense, unless there's a place where all you're doing is stirring the pot, which is which is good, which is sort of how I think of the Thursday morning OGM calls. It's like, I, I think of it as I, I dip the ladle in the stream, and, and then when I see something interesting, I stir the pot. That, that's my, that's how I facilitate the Thursday calls. I'm dipping the ladle and stirring the pot. Mm -hmm. um, and then separately, back to the idea of missions and all that, one thing I'm trying to do for myself, for the project I'm on, and for others in OGM and related uh, entities is, let's paint a mosaic picture of our mission or future, some, some, some image of our future. And I like mosaic for a couple of reasons. One, it's a low resolution image. Mosaics are like pixel art or you know, mind, uh, uh, mind blocks, what's it called? Uh, Minecraft. Okay. You know, it, it's like it's like large, blocky, low resolution kind of image, and mosaics decompose into tiles. And so, I'm actually trying to figure out. And I had a call yesterday morning about this very topic: um, How do we take a, a, an ambitious project and deconstruct it into tiles, which are fundable software projects? And how do we open a conversation across projects so that we recognize and then promote to the head of the queue those tiles that serve multiple projects at the same time? that are both a priority because they, they fix something important, but they also fix something in your project and something in your project. That's an important tile, let's get funding on that. And then how do we author the tiles so that they are composable? Open source is awesome, but open source with bad architecture doesn't really help. Right. Open source in some way that's composable so that it's usable in a variety of different contexts and tools is really wonderful. So, so I'm trying to figure out how to stand that up and it's really slow going. Um, but I feel like if we can stand that process up, have people writing pattern languages so that we can distill the wisdom and share that into the commons, and then, and then create a, I'm, 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 and I'm losing some of the different threads. But if we get some of these different things stood up, then different people with projects can show up, participate, pick up what they need, leave what they need, improve the whole process, and you know, lather, rinse, repeat from there. And then, in the middle of this is sort of what I'm thinking about as an attitude or an intentional approach, which you might think of as unmanagement, right? And, and unmanagement is a way of fulfilling all of these things, which are more operational. The things I just described are like, hey, how would I get this done? How would I, I'm sort of trying to riff on, how, do I, how would I use unmanagement to actually write some code to, to stand up and finish a project that is then useful to the whole community like yeah. that? And to me, like the painting of these mosaics is really important. And I'm not really sure exactly what that is yet. I can show you some diagrams I've drawn by hand 
<clears throat> that I haven't turned into um, online diagrams because I haven't sat down and said, okay, I've got to do that task. But but I'm experimenting with a thing called Excaladraw, which is a plugin for Obsidian, which has the nice feature that when you change a name in Excaladraw, it changes the page name in Obsidian on a, on a markdown file and, by, and I think vice versa, which means you can have drawings that interact nicely with texts which are in a pattern language or a body of, of documents. That gets tactically really interesting because you can then start playing with the different tools we're talking about in, in, you know, with each other. No, that's exciting. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to dive into Obsidian and Excaldra. I haven't played with, but they found they found very neat. I've, I've bookmarked that now. Um, another piece that strikes me is that again, from that sort of either funding or resources side, that when you have this mixture of sort of, uh, you know, if we're thinking in this case as like the projects as being the the. I mean, I guess you can do it either way, but you've got your different projects, and then you've got your different kind of software pieces or, or composable bits that can help with it. And when you have those all interlinked in a community, it makes it much easier to be able to say, okay, well, this given piece of software, here's the, here's the four different initiatives that benefit from that. So how do we get those four initiatives to help support that thing happening? And how do we roll together as easily as possible grant proposals that are then able to say, here's the thing that needs to happen. Here's the organizations that can write their memorandum of understanding and their endorsements of saying like, yes, this is something that'll move our work forward um, so that it becomes as easy as possible to support moving all the different pieces, getting all the cells that need oxygen, the oxygen they need. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in the middle of this, I'm gonna complicate things the way I did a moment ago. There's a bunch of projects in here that aren't well-grounded, aren't well-structured, are being run by somebody who has awesome ideals and intentions and no particularly good concept for what to do or how to do it. And they're in the mix as well. And you don't want to call them out. Um, you want to help them get somewhere, but you also don't want resources to go into what they're doing because you, you're you kind of sure, and I hate to say this, that's not that's going to be wait, you know, money not, not spent well. Um, and, how, and how do you bake that into the community so that that happens gently and well and so that the participants who aren't very good at some skill learn the skill right. and, and, and then ladder up to the point where they're creating the things that actually you go, oh, good. Now, now, now I see clearly that that's something we should support. And, and, and what really excites me about what you said there is, I mean, because of course, visualization is what comes to mind for me and doing it in a way that, you know, it takes some time because it has to be longitudinal, but where you then have trajectories and it isn't about saying, here's someone who is just bad at doing things. And instead you're able to say, you know, here's where you seem to be on your specific trajectory. These are the pitfalls that when we look at things are clearly the pitfalls for this. Here's some people who might be able to help mentor with some of that. Here's some projects that you should check out that have been particularly successful uh, in the areas that you're kind of in. Um, and it also provides that feedback so that, you know, for me as a project leader, I can look at it and say, okay, here's some places I need to improve. Um, and that me as a community member, I can look at and say, this is a project that's being, you know, the core group of this is, is really a bunch of movers and shakers who have done some really cool things in the past. So definitely I would like to, you know, contribute some resources to making this thing happen. And I, I think this process is hard. I, I think this, I think this is the right process, but I think it's just really hard. And I, the, the efforts I've made over the last couple of years through OGM to do this for different sub projects, I haven't made a lot of progress. It hasn't really worked. And I'm, I apologize. I'm going to have to I have, I'm physically needed elsewhere at the top of the hour, okay. um, which I, I'd rather not because I love this conversation. And I think we should talk more than once every very long period of time. Agree. Absolutely agree. Yeah. So, uh, Jerry, it was lovely to see you. <laughs> well, it's not it's not top of the hour yet. And you were about to say something. Oh, I thought you needed to. Oh, okay. No, no, no. no. Top no, of the no, hour. No, top no. of the hour. I'm just, I'm just giving us notice that eight, nine minutes from now, I need to boogie. Mm -hmm. Or actually, eight minutes because I have to walk to a different room. Mm -hmm. And what was the last topic that I was about to comment on? That's a good question. Um, so, how do you? Well, partly, I, I was putting in some of the bad news about. Oh, I know. Uh, the thing is, I think the solution for all of that is you just help people understand what are the needs of a project. Not No single person has to have all the skills. And th what I found worked really great with self-organizing teams is that people would do what they were good at. But if you, and 
also that early in a project, uh, wild-eyed, crazy people are your best resource and they're the ones I want to hang with and I want them to stimulate my brain. And then close to delivery, it's like, I don't want to see those people. I'm like, you, you no, no, no more ideas. Out of the room, out no of the room, ideas. go. No, but, but go find something else. And I want the person who will pick through everything so nitpicky that it makes my eyes glaze over, who I then love at the, during that part of the project. And so I think it's more about having teams where collectively you have what you need rather than having this notion of leaders who are supposed to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. I really like that. I have a small riff on temporary sort of, uh, what do I call it? Local and temporary hierarchy in the sense of, I don't believe in the non-hierarchical organization, but I think that, you know, at some point it's like, Mary, that's a great idea. Why don't you take us through that idea? And she's the leader for the next period until we're done with that process. And then fades back into the crowd. And then we lather and repeat. Yeah. So what do we do? If, uh, if you two are um, uh, okay with it, I would love to share this recording with my other two directors at Thomaso, um, as, as So my MO, <laughs> uh, so, so my MO is to post a lot of videos on YouTube every week all the time. I'm happy to post this openly to YouTube on my account or exactly. if you'd rather if you'd rather do it on yours either way. but but Did I'm I say anything mean about anybody? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, we're good. Yeah, good. So I'll just do that and I'll send you guys the link to the YouTube. I'll send you guys an open YouTube link to this call. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and then again, I, I, I sent a, uh, there's a link on the document that you made, Marie, to the unmanagement kit that we're trying to put together, which is just meant to be a basic, um, a basic document that says, here's some of the hallmarks for a situation where unmanagement might be appropriate. Here's some of the guiding principles that are important. Um, I, right now you both have commenter access, but I'd be delighted to just give you editor access on that to, to, to dump your thoughts on there as well. Um, I look uh, forward to checking it out. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and then similarly, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to talk about the pattern language side. I'm keen to talk, you know, at, at any point, I'm happy to talk about what are some of the things that we're kind of doing um, mm -hmm. either at Thomaso or that either of you are involved with. Um, where they might serve as good bridge points between theory and practice where we can kind of document and learn together. It would be amazing to see some, somebody actually um, intentionally adopt some of these practices. Yeah, so well, and that's not good. And we really are trying to, you know, there's a couple of organizations that we're in conversation with now that we're talking to, that that's part of why we need the kit is to be able to say, here's a thing that we think might be useful so that you can just define your mission, open the floodgates and kind of let the constructive chaos happen. I've, I've met two architects uh, and we got to talking about pattern languages and they both said, my MO is when I hit a new client, I hand them a copy of the book, a pattern language. And I say, if you like this, we can probably work together. I love it. <laughs> it's good. It's really good. It's like this book has the spirit of how I like to work. And in fact, if you absorb some of the patterns, it will raise our, our conversation. Yeah. Um, is it, Jerry, is, you're in Oregon. Is, is that right? That is correct. I mean, did, you, did, did you say Portland? Portland. Oh, okay. Um, if you're ever interested, I'd be more than happy to um, to also introduce, and you're, I forget, are you in Seattle? Um, I'm, I'm two hours south of Portland. Oh, okay, um, I'll double check to see where she is, but if you're ever interested, I'd be happy to introduce you all to Tree Bresson, who was the, um, she was the originator and spearhead for the group works pattern language happening. Um, great oh, person, fun. tremendous facilitator, has lots of, lots of neat experience and is just generally a, a great person. Um, so yeah, if you'd like, I'll, I'll send an email to, to the, the three of you to, to see what happens. That would be lovely. I would love that. I think she and I have crossed paths a very long time ago through Nancy White. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, but I don't know that we've, uh, we certainly haven't communicated in a long time and I'd love to be back in touch. And, and uh, when somebody says, hey, I'd like to write a pattern language, where's the on-ramp to that freeway? Is there, is there, a, like, um, is, is there a good one? Um, the, uh, one of the other things that I put in, and I don't know if it's a great one, but it's what the one that we have is, um, 
one of the documents, and I think there's a few other larger ones that we made at Group Works, um, but that is bookmarked or is commented on on the notes that uh, that Marie made. That is simply something that's like, what is a pattern? And it talks a little bit about like what are some of the hallmarks we used for trying to figure out like what what is a pattern and how to define those, and a little bit around our process of trying to come up with a pattern language. Cool. But it's a great question. I mean, I know the, mm -hmm. the you know the pattern language of process people and Helena and all those people are yeah. kind of engaged. I don't know of a good, a good how to guide. Okay. Uh, I'd love there to be one of some sort Me too. because I'm extremely interested in generating more pattern languages. And then as a small side note, early in uh, Open Global Mind, we, uh, we, we created a little experiment and one of us took semantic media wiki and basically stood up a semantic media wiki in the hopes of doing a pattern language generation for us as a group. And we, we started to trial it. And the first thing we hit was, it's very hard to change a pattern name because it doesn't propagate through the wiki. And you need to change pattern names really often. And we stopped using it immediately. Like, like the first bump we hit was a, was a deal breaker. And all the nice work that he had put in to sort of tune up a semantic media wiki for us, we set aside. <laughs> and we never went back to a different platform. So at, at this point, Obsidian markdown files on the GitHub repo is kind of the way we're going. And that's sort of the state of the art we've got. And it's not that easy or that friendly, but it's doable. OK, no, interesting. Um, yeah, we've not, not necessarily something suitable for that. It's funny, semantic media. Oh, actually, it's 1158. I won't go into story mode. Um, I could also leave you guys in the room. I can just pass the con, and you can keep talking. I don't need to I stop. Also get ready for, for the next meeting coming up but I would I would love to set up much more um, you know regular opportunities to talk and to and to bring some people in to see what sparks around the different pieces that we're talking about that would be I'd love that and you both have a standing invitation which I'll email to you but anytime you want to drop in every two weeks uh, Saturdays nine o'clock Clock Pacific time is when we have the um, Fomazo community meetings, which oh, right. sometimes it's just like Pacific but... time is when I FaceTime with my dad with Parkinson's. Ooh, okay. Wow. Um, I could maybe stop in at 10 o'clock is when I but go might to be, Aikido. I might be able to do 10. Yeah, yeah. 10 o'clock is when I go to Aikido, so. Oh, okay. Well, I can I can always double check to see, because we have a community meeting and we've just switched to doing community and directors meeting to see if there's ever a time where we switch those, then that would that would enable. So we'll- Awesome. Perfect. But thank you. If you'll send us a note, I'll, I'll, I'll add it so that I can know that it's there. Wonderful. And I'll also send a, an, an intro to our other directors because they're, they're fun people as well. Thank you both so much. This has been an, an inspiration and an energizer. Me too. Same. Really, really appreciate thank it. You, thank, you for, thank you for getting us kicked off again. My pleasure. Bye. Bye for now.